talk about a proposed amendment to H610, an act relating to firearms and domestic violence. Remember last time I was here, we went through a pretty thorough walkthrough of the bill as is. And I think I mentioned that when successive drafts come out, I use yellow highlighting to indicate where the changes are between the current draft and the previous one. And when I do that, I'll usually, or typically, uh, get rid of the yellow highlighting that showed the change between the previous draft and the one before that. So obviously, hopefully, as time goes on, there's less yellow highlighting to see because there are fewer changes, but that could change depending on whether or not what did, how, how the bill is going. But uh, the document that you see in front of you, version 5.1, you'll notice well, does have less highlighting than the previous one because there aren't as many changes between this draft, proposed changes, I should say, between this draft and the previous one. So I'll focus on those again, if that makes sense to everybody, to kind of where the changes are as opposed to starting from ground zero again. Can I just ask sure. something? In future drafts, now that it looks like we're going to start seeing a little bit less and less highlighting of the proposed drafts that the, um, the, the proposers are, uh, are putting forward, right. if we could, is it possible to choose a second highlighted color to see what the changes from the because what's happening is we're kind of, I'm, as I'm looking back in previous drafts, I'm losing track of what we've talked Change about. The prior, right? Exactly. Right yep. Just so that we have an idea of um, little the previous changes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure we could do that. Yeah. And I might say that the the uh, there are times when that can get a little blurry. Right. When you're changing so, a change. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Good way to put it. But uh, we can save that in a separate document. Close, closest as possible. Right, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, so as far as the, the highlights, uh, literally and figuratively, of, of this draft, there's, you remember the first section had to do with uh, background checks, generally, with the default proceed process in background checks specifically. One of the default proceed process is the provision in federal law that uh, allows a firearms transfer to go forward if the uh, if there hasn't been a response from the National <coughs> Criminal Background Check within 72 hours, within three days. So generally speaking, the transfer has to contact NICS, um, get approval for the sale, find out if the person who's purchasing it is a prohibited person, whether because of a criminal background or a, a mental health background or a fugitive from justice, any one of the other eight or nine listed categories and they find out whether or not that person is prohibited by virtue of being in one of those categories. And if they're not, they send them a unique identification number for the sale to proceed. And remember, under this default proceed process, if they don't get an answer within three days, the sale can proceed anyway. So that's the state of the law. The bill, as it was introduced, proposed, you see the highlighted language on lines 15 and 16 is new, and the, uh, uh, proposal originally had been that the, the transaction, the sale, cannot proceed until uh, there's a response from NICS that the person is not a prohibited party, not prohibited by any one of those categories. So in other words, that default proceed at 72 hours would not apply. You'd have to wait until they got a positive response and you couldn't go ahead and uh, proceed with the sale. Uh, even if there had been no response after three days. Everybody remember that? So that was the way the bill was introduced. See the proposed difference now? In a sense, it's a, you could call it a longer default proceed. You know, it's the same idea, it's that, but it's a 90-day provision, not a three-day provision. So if, if there's no response given from the, from the <coughs> to the proposed transferor, the person who's selling the firearm, after 90 days, they can go ahead and proceed. Um, Similar concept, longer period of time, or longer, but also perhaps shorter because it was it was indefinite. The way we 
the way it was introduced, there was there wasn't a cap. Yes, think, right. And, and that's and right. Longer than the existing federal law, shorter than as introduced. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just is there any other state that uses ninety days, or is this would this be a unique? I think the other, I, I think the longest ones I've seen are 30. I think, I think California and New York are 30 days. I'll double check that for you. But, uh, I, yeah, Patrick, I, I um, chose 90 because of the testimony. We actually mm -hmm. have 88, 88 days or three months, but um, but I guess after, my understanding is that after the, the 90 days, um, the case is thrown out or it's not, it's not, you know, pursued. So that's, you know. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and, and there are also two states that don't have any time frame on it. That have, uh, have what for was it. originally proposed. Like what we had originally oh, right. Anything else on the background check? Please? All right. So moving on from there to the uh, relief from abuse order section. Remember, these are provisions related to RFAs, relief from abuse orders, an order when uh, that the court issues when it finds that there has been abuse and that uh, there's going to be danger of further abuse. The order can contain a number of different things, you know, provisions to vacate the premises or to maintain a certain uh, <laughs> distance from the plaintiff, to uh, not have no contact, no contact order, so long as uh, those sort of protective orders, protective provisions that can be in the RFA order. And the provision in this bill, in 610, is specifically dealing with uh, firearms and how they're addressed in the relief from abuse orders. Remember that the, um, the concept had been uh, some particular provisions being required to be in the order, having to do with firearms, right? Those are mandatory provisions that would have to be in the RFA related to firearms. And it sort of goes from the bottom of page four onto the top of page five, but these are mandatory provisions. One had to do with firearms relinquishment. The other had to do with residency requirement, where, uh, whether the person had to vacate a residence. And there's a third one that had to do with uh, a notice, providing notice to the defendant that they're going to be prohibited from possessing firearms going forward. So you'll see uh, the, in some ways it's, I think I mentioned this earlier, it's a little counterintuitive that in the statute, the final order comes before the emergency order. Because what happens chronologically first is the emergency order usually. Now there isn't always one, but that's, if there is, that would come before the final. So we're looking at the final order first here, and this is the one, the permanent order, the final order, uh, maximum of a year. But remember, the, the emergency order is the one that can be got ex parte. The, per the defendant doesn't have to be there. The person can go, the victim can go in on their own, plaintiff uh, make a showing of harm, uh, the abuse, and uh, threat of future abuse, and get the order without the defendant's presence. But then you have to have a final hearing within 14 days. So you've got 14 days within which the final one has to be scheduled. So in the final order, which is what we're looking at right here, you see for a while there had been sort of this back and forth discussion in the committee about should the relinquishment piece of the final order be mandatory? Remember that? Should it be, should it be a shout? Should it be a may? Should it be required? Should it be discretionary in, on the part of the court? Um, in the previous draft, you see that there had been a proposal that um, that the uh, order be mandatory, and this is the struck language, lines two to four, page five. The order was mandatory unless the court makes a finding that by clear and convincing evidence, uh, relinquishment is not required to protect the safety of the victim or the public. This actually goes back to the language, just kind of goes to your point about showing multiple drafts. This is going back to the language as introduced, which is uh, require the immediate relinquishment until the expiration of the order of firearms. So, the final order would require relinquishment uh, until the order itself expires in this proposal. Does that make sense to everybody as to how that would work? Um, we're going to jump, well, I think we'll go pretty quickly. I'm going to jump really quick to the uh, emergency order just so you can see that the difference between the final and the emergency. So this is on page six. And you see the emergency, the emergency order is different. This does not require um, relinquishment in all cases. This says, if the plaintiff's complaint or affidavit indicates that the defendant is in possession or has access to firearms, then it can be required. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. So it's not mandatory requirement in all cases. It's re relinquishment if the plaintiff has brought evidence either in the complaint or the affidavit 
uh, the defendant's got firearms or has access to them. And in that case, relinquishment is required. So again, difference between the emergency and the filing. So I'm showing is required at the emergency stage before relinquishment can be ordered. Whereas in the final, it's just relinquished, period. <coughs> and then similar change you'll see, uh, well actually this isn't really more. So this is the, back to the uh, final order again. And this has to do with vacating the premises, remember, or I should say prohibiting the defendant from residing at a resident where firearms, the residence where firearms are present. Remember that concept has been in the bill from the beginning as well. This proposal modifies that a bit, and instead of prohibiting the defendant from residing there, unless the court makes this clear and convincing finding, which is what had been in the last draft, says uh, if the order does include a requirement to vacate, because it doesn't know this, but it might. And if it does, um, and uh, uh, that's an express part of the order, then the defendant's going to be prohibited from residing at the residence where firearms can be accessed. So it's not necessarily where, it's not where they're present. It's a bit of a higher threshold. It's not just the present there, it's that in some way they can actually be accessed by the defendant. So if the order has a, a requirement to vacate the premises and um, the residence is a place where firearms can be accessed by the defendant, then it's got to prohibit the defendant from living. Is there a question on I, I think I know the answer, but um, I, I just wanted to clarify. So. If somebody is ordered to go, or if, if somebody decides to go to a family member's house and that family member does have okay. firearms but they're locked um, in, a, in a safe and the defendant does not have access to the keys or anything, that person is allowed to go to that house and stay there. That's the way I would read that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure. That could be one way which they would not have access. Right. right. Just wanted to make sure. Thank yep. you. Yep. Uh, I see no changes to the other provisions that have to be in the order. One sort of information providing that the defendant can't possess firearms until the order expires. Um, and also, uh, if the order does, in, does cover relinquishment, then they have to include information about the type of location of firearms. There is a bit... Um, so now we get to the emergency order the initial one that can be issued ex parte. We already went through the relinquishment piece. I mean, this includes uh, a relinquishment piece. If there's information in the plaintiff's complaint or affidavit that shows the defendant has or has access to firearms. The vacate language is the same as we just looked at. If the order has a requirement to vacate, then, uh, and, the, and the firearms can be accessed, then it prohibits the defendant from residing at the residence. Now you see there is, three and four are also the same, no changes. This is the information and the um, information provided to the defendant and information about the types of firearms that are there. Sub, subdivision uh, Roman numeral five though, you see that line 13, this is new and this is really connected to, you remember uh, we discussed last time the issue of once served, always served. And that idea is that when a person, when a defendant uh, is served with the emergency order, and service means personal service by a law enforcement officer. If they get served with that emergency order, then future orders uh, can be served by first class mail. The idea is, remember that I, discussion about, I think that's the piece that I assume I wasn't actually here for it, that the judge from New Hampshire talked about, because they had that process down there as well. The idea there being that um, once they've been personally served, once the defendant is personally served once, not to require the personal service the second time, and some language was added. I'm going to jump to that and then skip back so that you can see uh, what's in there. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Sorry. Um, All right. Should that be added in there that it, it is, they're going to be served by first class <coughs> mail? I mean, why is that left out? No, that's, yeah, yeah you're right. Uh, but uh, it's, that piece is just, uh, that is down here. I put a mistake. It's the, uh, But yes, that is elsewhere. For some reason, I'm having a hard time finding it now. Um, oh, here we go. Um, that's not it either. Um, but the first class mail piece uh, is covered, I believe, and on page nine. Yeah, oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. 
right there on uh, the very last paragraph, page nine, subdivision two. <coughs> so this is the situation I was just talking about. They've already been uh, served with a temporary order, that's line 16. And if that's the case, they can be served with all um, subsequent orders uh, by first class mail, the defendant's last known address. And the defendant has to inform the court of any changes. And then you see that last sentence, this is what's connected to the language we were just looking at, the very last sentence here. The subsequent <coughs> order, including any changes made to the temporary order, shall be effective when the subsequent order is issued. So in other words, you're not requiring personal service in the case of this later order, because they've been served personally the first time. So the uh, subsequent order is effective when it's issued by the court. And that's why this other provision that we just looked at is to notify the defendant of that point. In other words, that way the defendant is being told, look, if you've already been to this, to, if you've already been served with the first order, the emergency order, any orders that come after that, they're effective as soon as they're issued by the court. So this has to be in the emergency order. It's, the idea is to provide notice to the defendant that if there's any orders issued subsequently, they're going to be affected. Uh, they're going to be bound by those orders, essentially, when the court issues them. If I could, I think Ken's concern is that the, sorry to speak for you, oh, go, the dangerous I'm going. place for you is <laughs> that the person is not being told that the order is not going to come in a manner that they're used to receiving it. So oh, by I not telling the person, but check your mail. <laughs> right, right. Yes, yeah, good point. That's not in there, right? I missed that. Like yeah. follow, like yeah. follow through with it, so they know exactly what's going on. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Matthew. Yep. Yeah, that's right. That uh, that language is in there, but uh, but uh, the fair point. Um, so just a comment on that is, I mean, the idea isn't to have them check their mail. It is that they need to show up at the final hearing, presumably. Oh, I, I understand that. I'm yeah. more saying that a person may not know that this, reading that, they, they, they might right. be trying Maybe to adhere to that, but not. Better notice. Better notice yeah. and, right, gotcha. Right. Just letting them know that it could come by hand. Also. Everybody good with that piece for now? Um, this is uh, just some specificity. You know, you remember, and we'll get to this in a little bit, there's some specific provisions in here about what the return of service has to include. The return of service is when the law enforcement officer serves the defendant with the relief from abuse order. Here's the order. You have to stay away from the victim. You have to maintain whatever other conditions are listed. You have to adhere to the provisions of this order. Um, this is essentially a form requirement that's saying to the court, uh, make sure that when you when you update these relief from, or sorry, when you update these return of service forms, that it specifically includes this these requirements that are in the bill later on. So it's sort of a bit technical in that respect, but it's, so it's a directive to the court to make sure that these provisions are in the in the form that the court produces. This is a technical correction as well. You may remember, you may remember uh, Judge Grierson mentioned this, that um, defendants do not actually attend the emergency hearing, so there was no reason for, and this is existing law, this is under subdivision B1, subsection B1, um, that there was no reason to reference the temporary <coughs> order statute here because they don't actually attend it. So this is what I was just mentioning, the, um, the return of service form. This is the specifics of what has to be in the form itself. You'll see that um, there are some provisions added here between this draft and the previous one. In the previous draft that you looked at, the return of service had to include a specific language of, uh, about whether firearms were being relinquished by the defendant. So again, so when the return of service comes back to the court, because that's the way we're served on the the order is served on the defendant, the return of service goes back to the court, tells the court, hey, it was served. Tells them when and where it was served. This is requiring some specifics to be in the return of service about firearms in particular. First provision is the same as what we looked at last time, whether firearms were relinquished, but then it adds a couple of other provisions. What else has to be in this return of service? Whether a warrant is being sought. So in other words, you think about the law enforcement officer, because remember the warrant procedure has been moved to later in the chronology here. 
And so if the law enforcement officer, after serving the uh, order, has some reason to believe, some probable cause to think that the defendant still has firearms, they can no then go seek a warrant. So the return of service has to indicate that, whether or not they're going to seek a warrant at that time. As well as uh, subdivision three, if, if obtainable with reasonable effort, I see a typo there, two, two wids, um, the defendant's mailing address for service of future orders. And finally, in subdivision B, the court has to provide a copy of the return of service to the plaintiff. So the return of service is going to come back to the court with a law enforcement officer, and then the court provides the plaintiff with a copy. So that, well, that way, the plaintiff knows all this information that was, that's listed right above there, whether firearms are relinquished, whether warrants being sought, et cetera. And again, what we just looked at, what has to be in the form, these things have to be in the form that the court generates. Uh, some little, uh, just a minor change to sub CETA. This return of service generally has to be filed with the court at the earliest possible time, take precedence over other summonses, uh, but not requiring that the affidavit be filed at the time because, uh, again, that was a little premature because it's not necessary. The officer might not file an affidavit at that time, might not actually think that there's probable cause for anything, might not have a concern about firearms, so it's not necessarily true that there would be a Um now this is what happens if the defendant doesn't relinquish firearms upon service of the order, right? So we change it to, if they, if they don't relinquish firearms in a timely manner, this will be after service of the order, uh, and the law enforcement officer has probable cause to believe the defendant still has firearms, um, generally requires the officer to apply uh, to the court for a search warrant, and you see some added language on line 10, pursuant to Vermont Rule of Criminal Procedure 41, this was something that Judge Grierson mentioned, <coughs> Rule 41 um, contains all the procedures for filing a warrant, things about what time, it, uh, sorry, for serving a warrant, as well, it actually goes for filing for one, but what time of day it can be served, what's the manner in which you apply for one in the court, what has to be in the affidavit, what has to be in the application, etc. cetera. Uh, so I think um, Judge Grierson was mentioning that that without some reference to Rule 41 or, or some other express list of all the procedures that would be required, it wouldn't be clear what procedures the, the law enforcement officer had to go through when they were requesting this warrant. So that's why that piece is there. Um, you'll also see some added language, um, line seven. This permits, uh, so again, the officer isn't required to file for a warrant if what's known as a judicially recognized exception to the warrant requirement applies. And there's, there's five, I think, um, the courts over the years, because you know, generally speaking, Constitution requires probable cause and a warrant before a search and seizure can happen. Courts over the years have recognized a few exceptions to that, like uh, plain view, for example, if an object is in plain view, you don't have to go get a warrant. If the defendant consents to the search, you don't have to go get a warrant. If uh, ex exigent circumstances, you know, in other words, a hot pursuit, for example, they're right in the middle of a, of a crime pursuit. Um, so if one of those applies, then, then also uh, no requirement that the officer go seek a warrant. And that's tracked on civil language that you have, actually, in a couple of the, the drone statute, for example. You generally require law enforcement to get a warrant before they use a drone, but you have an, not one, an exception to the warrant requirement applies. So, you'll see the subdivision three here is struck completely. This was, well, what if, what if the officer doesn't have probable cause to seek a warrant, but they might have some reasonable suspicion that the person might still have firearms? There was a process set out here for, they have to conduct an additional investigation for 48 hours, let the court know how the investigation went. So that whole process is struck. So there's nothing, nothing gonna be specified about what's gonna happen in that situation. Uh, this is the immunity provisions. You remember this provides the enforcement officer with immunity from being sued civilly or being subject to a criminal prosecution for essentially complying with the terms of the statute. Um, the, as you saw the last draft, it was providing immunity if the officer fails to learn of or locate a firearm. The proposal here is to strike seizure, so um, they're not necessarily going to be immune, immune from failing to seize a firearm while executing a warrant. So I don't know that that's necessarily something that's uh, actionable anyway. Could I just interject with a quick question mm -hmm. about that? 
And I think um, from our discussion with you last time, I mean, even without the immunity around seizure, it sounds like there's lots of case law that would apply to provide potential immunity there. There would just be more than There's case, a ton of case, case law specific. about law enforcement officer liability for when they can be sued and when they can. So, so it's seizure. Not like creating yeah. some blanket like liability by removing that. Uh, I don't believe so. <clears throat> yeah, I think that uh, not having that there means that whatever the underlying case line is applied. Right. So otherwise, no changes to the immunity provisions, though. Um, that's the end of the, the RFA section. On to Erpo's extremist protection orders. <laughs> I almost think that there's no changes in this section between this version and the last version. Again, there's only the only um, change between the version as introduced and what you're looking at now is this language on page 14, and that's that. You remember, that as introduced, this permitted proposed to permit an extremist protection order petition to be filed by a family or household member. Under current law, it has to be filed by uh, the state's attorney or the AG. The uh, proposal here, and similar, same as the last proposal, was that if a family or household member does file for uh, an ERPO, it has to be done during <coughs> regular business hours. That's lines eight and nine. And yeah, I think all the rest is just making conforming changes. No changes to this provision. This is the um, the HIPAA provision that allows uh, healthcare providers to inform law enforcement officers when. Uh, they think that uh, there's a serious imminent threat to public safety. <coughs> conditions of release, also no change. That adds to the conditions of release that the defendant doesn't possess firearms or other weapons. And lastly, there are two additional reporting requirements uh, proposed in this draft, sections 13 and 14. Section 13 is a Department of Public Safety report reporting to this committee and the Senate Judiciary Committee on the progress of this modernization reform program and the steps it has taken to provide assistance to local law enforcement agencies in seizing and storing relinquished firearms. And an, an attorney general report in section 14 uh, requiring the AG to report to the same two committees on the progress of their firearms technical assistance project in implementing this act, including any remaining barriers to implementation. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, actually there's a change in the effective date, rather than uh, taking effect on passage, it's July 1st of uh, this year. <clears throat> I think the idea was to uh, provide, make sure that there, there's a little bit more time for the affected agencies to conform their practices, because you know, otherwise it might be effective in April, May, whenever that might be, provide a little more room. So I had a question I thought of after my initial sure. part on the default proceed portion. Okay. Um, so the way it works now, when you go in, you have the first day where you uh, submit to this check, and then you have the three business days, and then on the fourth day you get to get the firearm goes through, or if it does not go through. So this 90 days, is this 90 business days, or is it just specifically 90 days from the point of uh, when this is initiated? And is it 90 days from when it's initiated, or 90 days the day after it's initiated? Uh, uh, I'm not 100% sure about your latter question about whether it starts on that day or the next day, I'm not sure. But it is uh, calendar days, not business days. So generally the way, um, uh, unless you say business days, the approach to using days now in the Vermont statute is unless you say business days, it's calendar days. Okay. Yeah, but I'm not sure about the, if it started that day or the next day, I'm not, I'm yeah. not sure. And then the other one I had was on page 11, the judicially recognized exception to the warrant requirement. What would be a judicially recognized exception? Uh, as I say, there's, there's, 
I think, five that are most commonly known about um, plain view. So if an object is in plain view, the officer is outside somebody's home or stop somebody uh, on the highway and something is in plain view, there can be times when they don't have to necessarily go to the court and get a warrant. Um, Just a quick modification. If the officer's outside the home and can see it in plain view, that's not plain view. You actually have to have lawful presence to seize the object also. So you can't just see it. You have to actually be, it has to be within your reach as well, just so you're clear. We can't go into somebody's house because we see stuff on the table. Right, and I mean, if you were in the and house. For the, and for the record. Sorry, Mike yes. Carling, mm -hmm. that, that, that's a really important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, no, if you just identify yourself. Uh, Commissioner right. of Public Safety, Mike Great. Sterling. thank you. Right, assuming the, lawful, the officer was lawfully present where they had a right to be, then the, the object's in plain view, right? Exactly. So if somebody's invited, you say to the law enforcement officer, come in and talk to me, and they sit on the table? Yes, it's generally okay, because they've given okay. consent to the, right. to the presence okay. of the officer. <laughs> and consent is another exception. So that's one of the other warrant exceptions is the person can consent to a search. Do you don't have to go get a warrant if the person says, fine. Right. It's known that that one. There's, a, there's also, as I said, exigent circumstances. If it's in the midst of an of a, uh, emergency type situation, don't have to stop the chance, for example, and go get a warrant. Um, and then the fourth one is, uh, oh, incident to arrest. So if, uh, if while a law enforcement officer arrests somebody, they can do a search of the person. Don't have to go get a warrant right then. And the other one is um, what's known as a regulatory or administrative search. So if you think of, for example, uh, housing code, city housing code, you know, permits uh, officers from the city housing to go around and look at people's houses <coughs> to make sure they're in compliance with the, with the uh, city code. <coughs> Don't have to go get a warrant every time, as long as it's in conjunction with a sort of Regulatory system is in place. I think those are the five the most the most common ones. Yes. So just one more in that area yeah. on on two. If the de defendant does not relinquish firearms in a timely matter, is other true? people's timely matter might be different than my timely matter in this room. Is that, is that covered? Uh, you're right. I think there's some there's some uh, uh, flexibility there, some um, room for argument as to what would be done. And I think that's going to be ultimately based on the facts and circumstances uh, of a particular case the court's going to look at. But you're right. There's not specificity about what's timely and what isn't. And just on that same portion, for uh, flow of the sentence, should it be still have something referencing that there was service of the order and it was in a timely manner in that? Because we we strike upon service of the order, but it should should it have something like after service of the order in a timely manner after the service of the order? Yeah, that's a good point. That might add clarity. Right. Right. Yep. Just trying to go over the difference between the relief from abuse order and the emergency procedure. Because um, they are different. Um, and I'm not sure exactly the reasons why they're done that way. But the way I'm reading this, the one of the initial concerns that we heard in testimony was that we were mandating a um, that we were taking away discretion from the court <coughs> different um, circumstances. And the relief from abuse section under this proposal or amendment would continue to do that, correct? And so the final one, yeah, for sure. They'd be required to do that without discretion. Of the correct. Court. Yeah. Okay. But well, we are giving discretion here in the emergency one in certain circumstances, basically anything having to do with firearms. So on that form that we saw the other day, if that firearms box is checked, then the court is going to issue a similar order, even on a temporary basis. 
I didn't see the form. Was the checking meaning that, that the person has firearms? I guess I should say I didn't technically see it either, oh. but I did see uh, two, two people say there's a section on here about firearms. So if there's any mention of firearms at that emergency hearing, the court must, right. the court shall issue the relinquishment. I think at least if I would, if I mention, I would say I agree with you. Assuming that mention means that if they mention it in their complaint or affidavit, that's the way it's written. Um, uh, Does what's said in the in the proceed uh, in during the court hearing include? Is that included in a complaint? I would say the way this is written, no. Now that doesn't mean that if the plaintiff at the hearing mentions a lot, mentions firearms that the court couldn't go ahead and still include that, but not require. But that would be at their dis at their discretion based on what their best judgment is, whereas we are taking that judgment away and basically just saying <coughs> you in mentioned those, it in those circumstances. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is draft 5.1. Right. Last draft was 4.1. One before that, 3.1. When, when we were, I don't know if this is for you, Eric, just some concerns that I have. We had 3.1 at one time on the table. And at the, at a late hour, I'll say there was some, um, major changes uh, to it, some, uh, some uh, major amendments. And unfortunately, a lot of people who were um, testifying at the time were going to testify on 3.1. And but when, they, when we came in to meet, uh, 4.1 was on the table. And which kind of made some of the testimony uh, that was uh, prepared a moot point because just because things were changed. And um, my concern now is it's, it could possibly happen again. I mean, we have a, a list of I don't know ten or twelve people um, on the on the list to uh, testify today, and I'm going to assume that. Uh, that most or maybe even all um, are going to be testifying on draft 4.1 and in, in, uh, in not this new draft 5.1. <clears throat> and, and another concern I kind of have is uh, um, I feel like we're circumventing the committee process because we went from draft 3.1 to 4.1, which had some major changes, and there was really no committee discussion, no committee vote to whether we were going to accept partial or all of, all of the changes. And, and now my concern now is that there's, you know, another uh, uh, large group of changes in 5.1. And I mean, are we going to do that again where it just kind of slides through uh, without a lot of committee discussion or any committee votes? So that's just some concerns that I have. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, Tom, but I think that's one of the reasons why I was asking for trying to keep track of the changes, mm -hmm. because I I understand, you know, and I, I, I appreciate that, um, you know, the main proposers of this are trying to, they're listening to what's being said and trying to come up with stuff, but at the same time, no one has a right to amend the bill once it's in the committee, with the exception of the committee as a whole. So. So right, I, so I agree. As far as we didn't, we didn't uh, uh, okay the, the but, amendments to four point one. But they can they can submit as many drafts as they want for consideration by the committee. But I think that at the end of the day, right now six ten looks like it was introduced because the committee hasn't taken a vote yet to to change it. What I'm what I'm suggesting is that in the future, based on testimony, uh, when the bill passes out of here, we could pick some stuff from the original bill, some stuff from 2.1, some stuff from 4.1, and maybe some stuff from 5.1 or 10.1 if we're up to that at that point. But, um, you know, as of now, this this draft, the former drafts, they mean nothing because the committee's taken no action. 610 still resembles mm -hmm. its original 
No, four. No, thank you. I, I appreciate that. But, um, uh, the, the, I'll go back to my other concern of people who are testifying on 4.1. Um, I think that's fair. Got everything prepared, and here we are on 5.1. And, and I personally, I would say uh, I would have no problem at all with anybody rescheduling uh, their testimony um, so they can come in and testify on 5.1. But yeah, just a comment. On, I mean, certainly in in other situations, and it can happen here again. If uh, if somebody's not prepared to testify to these, yeah, you're right. They can they can ask and say they're not prepared to testify on certain items. We did get this out to folks yesterday at the end of the day, but again, if that wasn't enough time and they don't want to testify in those aspects, then yeah, obviously right. we'll give them more time. Yeah, I don't I don't know yeah. if it was enough time for people. Right, right. It wasn't the last time, and it was out about two and two hours earlier, the day before. <clears throat> Any questions for Eric? All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We will hand over there. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. But that's that's a clarifying. That's great. That's great. Everyone wants to go last today for some reason. I'm going to listen for a while as well. Um, for the record, Mike Charlie, Commissioner of Public Safety. Um, we did get the bill uh, last night uh, along with a variety of other work. So I have been through it. Um, and it was really helpful to hear David's uh, run through as well. Um, I know the VPA is going to be in. They've shared some comments with me, but uh, I haven't had a chance to really digest uh, in full their uh, position as well to speak to that. So I'm just going to work off the uh, existing version of the bill, and I think I will actually be brief. Um, it's an, but from where the Department of Public Safety sits, I think it's an improvement over the last draft that I testified by phone. Um, again, thanks for letting me do that. Um, overarching concerns continue to be uh, prescribing particular uh, types of work, especially as it relates to search and seizure. Um, you started to hear a very brief, um, less than a fraction of a percent of the description of how complex the search and seizure environment is. Uh, there's actually a great uh, treatise, if you have an extra um, six weeks of your life, uh, written, by, written by a guy named Wayne, Wayne Lefebvre on search and seizure. It's two full volumes that make the green books look like uh, a kid's picture book. Uh, that's how complicated uh, this operating environment is and how complicated it is to train uh, folks. So the point of saying that is that uh, adding a directive component of getting a search warrant does create added complexity in our operating environment uh, in an environment that is already difficult uh, to navigate. Uh, we actually ran into some, some statutory language yesterday, uh, not in the building, but this was operational, where um, there was no real conceivable way for uh, a law enforcement officer, in, in this case uh, it was language that directed a chief to do something specific. There's no way for them to know that that language even exists unless they were a chief at the time this happened. So I bring that up just to say the the complexity of what we're doing um, it needs a systems approach. So uh, uh, I'm not saying don't direct search warrants at this stage, I'm just saying there's a danger in that, in adding that level uh, of complexity. My suggestion on that topic is to... A danger to who? It's a danger to everyone, really, because the consistency with which we train 1,100 people to operate, you, you've got to ensure that... Let me back up 10 steps. We expect a police officer in the 21st century to do everything from being able to interview a three-year-old who's a survivor of a crime to be able to kick in a door on a tactical search warrant. There are very few people on the planet who can do all of those things at a super high level. So as a result, it's really a team environment. We have to be able to have people that can do cross-sections. Occasionally, they can do all of it. And one of those sort of technical topic areas is criminal law 
patrol procedure, um, being able to operationalize all that stuff that's behind you in those green books, which no longer exists just in, in one or two places, Title 13 historically, the rules of criminal procedure, is now scattered across an innumerable number of statutes. The more complex we make it, the more chance there is for error. Um, so what I'm saying is there is a robust system for how we do search and seizure, how we train search and seizure, how we train probable cause to get search warrants. This is part and parcel of something we do every day, adding another fragment of direction on it just further fragments the operating environment and makes it more confusing to operate it. So the chance for error goes up because we have added <coughs> complexity. Um, so so you're, you're talking, um, I, I guess you could say, danger trying to follow the policy and an inherent danger in the practical end of it where you're out in the field. More of a danger there. Yes. But, uh, so I, I, I don't know if you can put a number on it, but I get, how much more dangerous would it make it in the field? No way to know that. So right. that goes to my suggestion, See, which is yeah. So, yeah, if, if I was going to make incremental progress on this topic, the first thing I would do is look for information on the, the scope of what's happening. So in the roughly 700 abuse prevention orders that are issued every year, uh, how many involve <laughs> firearms? And then how many uh, are there uh, instances where we have probable cause? So start to track that. Um, there will be differing opinions on whether to track that using the abuse prevention order form, the return of service. We don't have another mechanism at the moment. If you recall from my testimony, we are actively pursuing two new information technology systems, a core computer-aided dispatch and records management system and an electronic warrant system that will eventually also cover abuse prevention orders that will allow us to do that in a much more robust way. It'll actually also allow us to systematize some of these things and create a better flow to defragment a lot of this work, but those things don't exist yet. So we are working to address some of the concerns that I'm talking about uh, as rapidly as possible, but in the current operating environment, uh, my concern remains continuing to add complexity. Uh, again, I'm stopping short of saying it's the wrong policy choice. I just want you to be aware of the um, of the concerns. Um, so, I assume you're, you're talking about what's at page 1011, which is the warrant requirement. Directed search warrants. Yes. Right. So, what we're trying to get at, as I understand, is for this situation is the timing or urgency, and then also keeping the victim in the loop so there's some sense of safety that something's being done. Yes. And I think I think we're open to suggestions. Uh, we, we keep on trying to make sure that we're not impinging on the discretion of law enforcement to safely execute uh, the warrant, uh, to safely determine whether the warrant's required, uh, to serve the RFA. And I, you know, there's some additional language I know that Beth Novotny is offered that makes that a little, makes that clear, and, and I think that that language is good. But that's that's what we're after. And if there are suggestions Understood. of how else to get to that goal, I'm certainly open to. That. So short term and long term suggestions. Short term, um, I'm not opposed to adding what, I'm, what essentially amounts to a checklist uh, with a few additional questions to the return of service on the abuse prevention order service. Uh, eventually where we're headed, and by eventually I'm hoping that is within the next 12 to 18 months, but uh, it will depend on how fast we can work with the courts to adopt some new electronic <coughs> systems. When, once the electronic warrant system can handle abuse prevention orders, the technology we can deploy, it will allow us to send updates. With, has everyone shopped at Amazon? You get updates every time something happens. You make the order, they ship the order, the order is delayed. That technology exists for us to do exactly the same thing with abuse prevention orders. If you get an order and you give an email address, every time that order is touched in that electronic system, you'll get an email saying, here's the update. Not that necessarily that what's happening with the judiciary, although we might eventually be able to build that, but what's happening with its service um, in the law enforcement realm. What the law enforcement agencies received it. It's been served. It's, um, they've made multiple attempts, but it hasn't been served. It, however we set it up, there'll be a, a much more 21st century way for people to get that information. 
Um, so that's the that's that, that's both the long, the short view and the long view to how to create systems around how to do this. You're going to get sick of hearing me talk about systems for the next four months, but that's the approach we're taking: is how do you systematize and what we do so that you can get reproducible results that we want. Does that answer your question, sir? Uh, it, it does, and, and uh, I, that doesn't necessarily address uh, on page 11, subsection 2, which is the component that states if the defendant does not relinquish firearms in a timely manner and the law enforcement officer has probable cause to believe that the defendant possesses zones or controlled firearms, the officer shall essentially seek a warrant. Um, what we're assuming there is that we're not doing that already. So what I'm suggesting is, A, let's measure that to begin with so we know whether we've got a problem to solve, and then uh, go from there. It, direct, we're, we're, the statute books are creeping into lots of different areas directing operational or directing, non, directing us to do things or directing us not to do things that are really granular things. And there's a hazard in that because when, if that keeps going, you'll have we'll have a, a the federal constitutional overlay overlay these two gigantic in search and seizure just in search and seizure to say nothing of all the other topics, two gigantic volumes written by Lefebvre that guide, guide this. It, it's a, I shouldn't say they guide this. The courts guide it, but there's that much information that it has to be synthesized into volumes because it's it would take up rooms otherwise. Then we've got a whole policy, we, then we have state statute, then we have the policy overlay, um, and then you actually have to operationalize all of that on a day-to-day -day basis where there are hundreds of events occurring and you have to have some flexibility in the way that you prioritize a limited number of resources to execute all this stuff. All I'm talking about right now is search and seizure. There's a hundred other topics that intersect what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm simply cautioning you that the more we do that, the more you say, A, do this under these circumstances, or B, don't do this, or don't use this tool, it, it's, it's just not a good way of, of, um, of managing day-to-day -day complex operations in statute. Just one follow up on it. And, and how would you suggest, uh, I mean, is there a way that we could measure whether this is happening? You mentioned that. that as you start with a form, you really only have 700 forms that come in, right? It, it's That's not a giant universe in a, in a year. How many of those are going to involve firearms? I don't know the answer, but I'd be surprised if it's more than 20%. So that's 100, and, if I'm doing math correctly, that's 140 forms. We can actually hand count those. <laughs> This isn't a giant universe of things. So, so I'd start with, with that. The return of service, the information, the checklist that we're talking about? Yes. And again, I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be focusing on these things as reducing a risk profile in an event. That, that if there are firearms present and um, there's an abuse prevention order in play, that does enhance the risk profile. We should be acting on that. I'm just questioning the methodology, whether that belongs in a statute, because it becomes an immovable object at that point. So I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding your testimony. I think what I'm hearing you say is don't change police practice in through statutory revision, but change the form and collect more data and look at the issue? Or do you think in changing I'm the form sure. that that will lead to the, that that will lead to the change? The measurement of something changes its outcome, right? So I'm suggesting that by measuring it, that's the first step to elevating its importance in the scheme of things. I'm not suggesting, however, that this kind of a, a scenario is not already important, that we aren't looking for creative ways to ensure that victims are safe, even in the absence of this, but <coughs> adding tools is not a bad thing. Um, directing prescriptively exactly the, the methodology to do it is, uh, is a little more difficult. 
Um, so how would you then, if there weren't clear directives, address the variability in police practice from you know, law enforcement agent to law enforcement agent? Let's measure it first department. and see if there's disparity. And this goes to the larger systems context, right? So we want to ensure that we get similar outcomes in all 251 Vermont communities. That is about delivering systems. And if, 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 I think next week I'm going to have an opportunity to talk in greater depth about our modernization strategy. That's the crux of, of where we're headed, is create consistent outcomes for Vermont communities using a variety of strategies, from data to better supports, to be better state supports to lo local uh, and county law enforcement and public safety entities in general. Um, we've got an entire strategy for that. So it's not about solving one inconsistency, it's about trying to help folks create consistent outcomes um, <coughs> universally. I don't think you're getting inconsistent outcomes because folks want inconsistent outcomes. It's because it goes back to the complexity. It's a really complicated operating environment, and that's what creates inconsistent outcomes. The more we can create systems and checklists for things, the better the outcomes are going to be. That's the approach we're taking to, pro to pretty much everything in this modernization realm. There's more nuance than that, but if you take it at the 80,000 foot view, that's how to push things forward into the 21st century. And do you feel like, just one follow up question, if that's okay, and do you feel like, so, um, hear what you're saying about needing to measure and understand disparities and um, gather better data and create more consistency. I think that's, um, I really appreciate your focus on that. I think that's very in line with what we've been talking about in this committee. Um, but I guess my question is then recognizing that these are really high risk situations for um, people who are the ones experiencing the risk and the, and the increased risk of fatality, which I think we've seen enough data not to, you know, have to argue against that reality. Do you, what are your proposals to, I mean, do you feel like just gathering the data and creating the checklist goes far enough to increase safety and protections for people in those situations? Well, you're well, creating we're another mechanism for a court order to uh, to direct the relinquishment of firearms. That's the, and that's the core of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, how you get at them is already set out in these giant treatises and rules and everything else. Mm -hmm. okay. um, <clears throat> I've already been here longer than I anticipated. I just uh, have some questions. Uh, I have a couple other topic areas on the bill, oh, but okay. at least um, real, real quickly, um, I, I agree with you that the um, that, that mandating search warrants essentially can be problematic, and I was just wondering if, in order to clarify this more so for the committee, could you provide any sort of real world examples or scenarios in which? Um, creating this sort of micromanagement could be problematic for officers on the road as well as public. Uh, well, I don't have a real world example of this because we haven't had this happen yet, but uh, there. Uh, I'm trying to think of a, a recent example. Uh, the statute that governs unmanned aerial vehicles that are described in statute as drones has already proved to be limiting um, in some circumstances where I don't think you intended it to be limiting. Um, the, uh, the last firearm storage uh, statute that was passed that allows us to store via VGS the nature of the language actually created what I gather was about a year's worth of consternation between various administrative attorneys that a, a, and a log jam that I had to break when I arrived at public safety to actually say, just stop arguing about this and do it. But they were right. The, conf the, the statute was written in a way that didn't 
um, allow for it. Didn't it wasn't op we couldn't operationalize it. It, it, it got stuck <coughs> on itself in the language, for lack of a better description. So um, th those are the two that I've run into most recently in my new role at public safety. Thanks. Okay. So, so I'm wondering if one way to, in the meantime, while you're systematizing stuff, is to look at where the system failed. Because there are a few cases of people who have been killed after they put in a from the disorder and see where did the system go, what can be done or put on the checklist right away so that we can all sort of sleep better that while you're systematizing it, maybe we're keeping somebody else from, or where the tragedy was averted, like where were you successful in doing that? <coughs> Just so that, again, I think um, knowing that you're systematizing it is great, but it's still, leaves unease, I think, for some of us about people that are just so vulnerable in the meantime. To answer that question, I would uh, ask that you take testimony from Major Jonas or someone on the operational level who, um, there's so much going on that I can't reasonably convey at all to you, the, the, the operational improvements that are constantly in progress. And measuring it, I agree with you about if you measure it, it becomes important. But we have a number of law enforcement agencies that just ignore our forms. So <clears throat> I, I have know. some thoughts on that that aren't okay. quite ready for prime time, but okay. uh, okay. I'm happy to talk offline to begin with and okay. then to begin to work on that. I mean, I'll, I'll say, I will say this. If you're going to be a government agency, you need to, you need to draw color within the lines. Mm -hmm. Some of it, however, so if that's happening and they're just ignoring it, that's, a, that's an operational problem that we need to address. At the same time, it goes back to my um, description of the complexity. It's so complicated that I don't know how we reasonably expect that people are going to know all the things we've asked them to do. Um, it, I observed j just yesterday, there is no mechanism to communicate to law enforcement agencies what you've done at the conclusion of a session unless they are paying attention. It just doesn't exist. There, it's not like there's a, a, a letter that goes out from <laughs> the legislature saying, hey, not for nothing, but we just changed all the stuff that impacts you. Um, we don't have a system for that. We're going to build one, but it's going to take a little while. I think the citizens that we want to follow the law are that. Right, we've now made this illegal, and unless it's newsworthy, they don't have any way of knowing that. Um, thank you very much uh, for that. I'm not systems geek myself, so I, I do understand. We can commiserate um, later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but just to um, put a little context around it, uh, thinking about the testimony that uh, Judge Grissom gave um, a few days ago, around the work that judiciary does at the end of session. You know, he and his division sit down and go through all of the work that we've done that relates to the judiciary. The forms that need to be changed, edited, amended, all of that happens. So to get back to the date uh, question about timing, if we didn't allow that extra time, all of the work that the judiciary does, and that's excluding the work you guys have to do too, but all of that work that has to happen just gets, it, it turns into a kerfuffle, for lack of a better adjective. And it gets done, but uh, it, it, it pressures the whole the whole system, and we hope that nothing gets lost in that conversion. Uh, and I think that it's really critical, especially when we're talking about uh, designing new systems that allow the two integral agencies to work very seamlessly. Uh, kind of has to be part of the design. 
you know, that functionality to make it work. Because other, otherwise, like you said, we're creating a monster. You know? And um, arms, legs, tail, you know, multiple legs, you know, and multiple tails. And yet, we're all concerned about our citizens' safety. You know, that's first, foremost, front, center. And so it, it I, I, I can just sense it, it's not a, a, a tension. You know, it, it's like, holy crap. You know, you know, how are we gonna? Everyone wants to make progress. Right, right. You know, Major Jonas uh, two weeks ago came in and explained some of the operational work that she was doing around training the barracks, around how to address, you know, the the harm in that domestic violence, you know, reaction, and she's only gotten through part of your agency. And so you say to yourself, what's going on with the rest of them? You know, I mean, and that's not, you know, to make light of it, but, you know, there's, there's so much going on. And not to say that we shouldn't, you know, do something about it, but I think we really need to be uh, cognizant, you know, of that and try to be a little ahead of the curve as far as trying to make it more functional, you know, as we move forward. And, and I'm not quite sure how we do that other than having these conversations, you know, and then being responsive to the needs of the people that are working with us, not for us, with us. Because it is, a, if we don't approach this together, you know, we're gonna not be in a good position. So, anyways, I just, I agree. But we tend to, just to respond to what you said, sir, the, we tend to try to make progress by adding things. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that sometimes making progress is actually about simplifying things mm -hmm. and taking things away. Um, you see that in contemporary software development. You start out with a million lines of programming code, and in order to make it work for all of us, it ends up being half that. It's actually stripping out functionality to make it useful for humans. So we can only handle so much. So if I can turn you to the return of service, the checklist questions that we have. Um, do you have any input on, uh, there's three questions that we have at this point. Are those the right questions? Uh, are there additional questions? Are there problems with those questions? I don't know if you have that for you. It's page 10. Uh, I do, and I hope I have the right page printed. 5.1 is current. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what the value of which types of firearms were relinquished is, um, but that's just a. Um, so yeah, if, if we're trying to whether firearms are relinquished at this point, hopefully you're looking at them. The same. It's possible that so I have a, a five, an older 5.1, uh, yeah. 345 p.m. yesterday. Yeah, maybe Coach can show you that. Okay. You've simplified it since you bought it. Right. Other warrants being, whether firearms were, whether warrants being sought, mm -hmm. mailing address. That seems fine. I know there, not to complicate matters, I know there was some consternation over the question about whether probable cause existed as a point in time question, and I haven't really wrapped my head around whether it makes sense to ask that. Yeah, or we not. struck that uh, based on uh, input from uh, Beth Milan himself. Um, these look fine. Right, I'm going to try to get out of your way now, yeah. but uh, a couple of just additional fragments. Um, I did hear a committee question around potentially removing the immunity because a body of case law exists around this. That doesn't work for us. You have to have the specified immunity. Um, due respect to the attorneys in the room, suing government has become a sport, and um, we, we will, it will cost the government an enormous amount of money just to fight about this if you don't have the immunity components. We might even, might even cost us money to fight about it with the immunity components, but you need that extra veil of protection um, to insulate the taxpayers from the frivolity of uh, the tort process today. Um, 
I'll get off that soapbox now. Um, Can I, could I just ask a clarifying question about that? Um, mine page that provision is. I don't think it's um, highlighted. No, no, it is changed. It's uh, page 12, line 9. So you're saying the removal of the word C's there? Is it I have some concerns over, I would add, I would leave C's in to be clear that, because we'll face arguments about, well, the seizure versus something else. But I think most importantly, I, I heard a question about that. I just wanted to flag that it's important to leave the immunity uh, components in. As, or it will cost the taxpayers money. So as drafted now, it, it says a law enforcement agency shall be immune from civil or criminal liability for failing to learn of or locate a firearm while executing a warrant. Do you think that's adequate? I'll leave that to the attorneys on the adequacy. I'm just flagging don't remove it because you think there's existing case law that's going to somehow cover it. That's all I'm saying. But what is the added benefit of the word seeds in your Any attorneys in the room want to uh, give a treatise on uh, how, our, how often we argue about a single you know, word? That's fine, but, uh, you know, you, you, someone's going to argue that it was the it was the more words in the immunity component, in my opinion, the better, because someone's going to argue if it's not in there that this was it was the seizure that was the violation, and therefore you owe us money. And I want to be really clear: if we're if we've done something wrong. It, you know, that's part of the process. We pay money. It's not actually the way that the, the system works right now. It's organized extortion. So I can't be any more blunt about that. Um, Sorry, I interrupted. No, it's okay. That's the same question I was trying to get yeah. at. Uh, okay, to move on. Did you have a question? It, it, it. Thank you. It just seems like to me, like what I'm hearing is we're making this tougher and tougher for you to do your job. We're already working on different ways to go and do this. You know, we're, we're a little bit far be further behind in what maybe we should be. We need to give you time to go and work through this and not convolute it enough so you can catch up to the time we need to do. Otherwise, on the portions I've testified on, that's correct. Uh, having the judiciary have the ability to order uh, relinquishment um, on a case by case basis may improve safety. So, uh, but, but important to note there as well. I'm going to touch the third rail here. Yeah. Um, if someone has firearms, we, one of the scenarios that uh, was told to me yesterday evening was, well, what if they have 100 firearms and you have one police officer and you have to seize them at the time that you're serving this order? How do you actually operationalize that? And I said, well, the mutual aid system, we're, it's going to take a variety of, it'll have an impact to availability of folks in that area at that time, um, but it can be done. And what it brings up, though, is this age-old discussion of is it if somebody's got 100 firearms in their basement they know 100 other people that have 100 firearms in their basement if someone really wants to get a firearm they're going to go get it somewhere else so I just I don't want to start this debate but I do think it's a I would be remiss if I didn't throw down the placeholder that the way to mitigate risk is to ensure that if someone poses a risk, that we incapacitate them from being able to do bad things. And there are other things happening in the building right now that diminish our ability to do that. If we can't hold the folks that pose a risk because of DV or something else, taking their guns away is going to incrementally improve safety, but it will not ensure safety. Right. There's so many other things that can be used as weapons, and there's so many other ways to get them. So, it, just important to know, it's, again, not to say that you can't make some progress with this bill toward ensuring the safety of victims of domestic violence, but be careful not to overemphasize how impactful this is going to be. 
Yeah, I, I just feel like we're putting putting you and your um, law enforcement in under so much scrutiny you can't do your job and it, it makes it more um, unsafe for you to do it you're 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 just out there and it's you're limited to what you can do and then it loads up the court system and then they're they're bogged up too that they can't do anything yeah there's a piece of that there's also it, there's it's it's complicated yeah i think i get it thank you um, I, I mentioned the focus on, on tracking, I think, is a good, uh, a good incremental step. Uh, I think I've got everything else. Uh, there was a question about effective on passage versus a date. If, depending on what you put in there, there's a training component to this. You've got to train 1,100 plus people, so you need time to do that. If you make it effective on passage, there will be errors instantaneously, and there will be errors for months. So those are... Is 1,100 all law enforcement in the state? I think that's full-time certified folks, so it's 1,100 plus. But the folks that will be doing DV investigations, that's, I think, the general universe. So it's probably a little premature to ask you the timing uh, as far as for the effect of what, what the date is until you see where we land. But um, you know, certainly we'll, we'll hear from folks as far as what how much time is needed and put that into effect. I think at a minute, or six months of training uh, time is probably reasonable. Because it, it won't, it dep again, depends on what's in there. It's not just the law exists, this, but now we have to try to figure out how to operationalize it and what the other legal implications are. And it, there's, you know, how do you weave it into the existing uh, criminal investigation construct and the criminal law construct? And we got to get the civil attorneys in to say, all right, well, Here's the guidance on how not to get sued doing this with or without an immunity statute. It's not as easy as do this. It's crazy. It's indescribably complicated. Thanks. Yeah, I have a question on section 13, the report. Um, oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, I almost skipped that. That would be bad. So maybe I'll let you speak before I ask the question. <laughs> um, the only thing that struck me as unusual was there. there's, and I, I sort of know why now from a conversation last night, it added um, steps taken to assist in seizing and storing firearms. I had spoken specifically to the storage issue and to our commitment that if all other systems fail for these kinds of cases, that we will uh, we'll find a way to store uh, the guns. Uh, I have a sense from the VPA on what the issue is relative to seizing. It relates to uh, the example that I gave you a moment ago. If you're stuck at the door and there's a, a defendant in an APO um, or yeah, in an APO that has a hundred guns in the basement, how do you operationalize the seizure? Um, so I, I guess I, I don't know what we would have to report on that because we have existing systems for mutual aid and how to call for assistance. So as constructed, I don't know what we would report relative to the assisting people with the seizure. That's all. Um, so the question is, I'm, I'm happy that you don't have to actually, it looks like you don't have to pre prepare a report. You're just presenting something that's good. It's like to me, but it's just reporting yeah. too. Uh, so that's a, a good step. But I'm just, so is this information that's relatively um, works within your current resources and accessible information to compile without a lot of hurdles or? Needed this the, syst the system to do it doesn't exist yet, but we're um, we have our legal counsel uh, working actively to draft the MOU for agencies if they need rollover storage oh, of some some kind. <laughs> I've been here too long. That's why you're throwing. Things. Um, you do the same thing to me. <laughs> 
Uh, sorry, I got distracted now and that. I don't know where we're going. I was scared myself. Um, we were talking about the um, the. Oh. The, the recording and, and durability. We're building the system for rollover storage uh, right now, and um, you know it, it's essentially counting <laughs> what we're doing. It, it shouldn't be that hard. So you're saying if we remove the word seizing, and you would be able to? You could leave it in there. I don't know what we would report. Okay. So I would suggest taking it out because I'm not sure what we would. Absent other guidance, I don't know what else we would do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, and for the record, uh, my name is Jeffrey Wallen with the Vermont Crime Information Center, which is part of the Department of Public Safety. And I just wanted to provide uh, a brief update on some statistics um, that I had provided last week. I was able to get some additional information based on the conversation and the request of the committee, and I wanted to share wanted to share that information this morning. Um, I was able to work with uh, some staff from the uh, ATF to get some additional information on firearms recovered. Um, some of it just came in this morning while I was sitting in the corner reviewing, reviewing the information uh, there. Uh, I'd like to provide briefly some numbers about 2018, which is the most recent year we have complete data. I think that makes it easier to wrap our heads, for me at least, to wrap my head around what we're talking about rather than dealing with 35 months or most of a year or a quarter. But a year seems to be, for me, the easiest way to wrap my arms around it. Um, in 2018, uh, there were 41,000 500 total firearms checks conducted in Vermont by FBI. <clears throat> of those checks, 40,666 were completed within three days, the three business days requirement, which is 97.87%. <clears throat> which means, if you do the math, there were 884 not completed in those three days. <clears throat> Say that again? I'm sorry. There were 884 that were not completed within the three-day requirement. <clears throat> Once you cut that three-day passes, it's up to the, the FFL to decide whether or not they want to release the firearm or not. It's a discretionary matter at that point. <clears throat> of those that were preceded past the three days, uh, there were nine firearm retrievals issued by ATF in 2018. So of the 41,550 checks that were done, there were a total of nine retrievals issued by the ATF, which means someone received a gun after the three-day requirement that they shouldn't have because they turned out to be ineligible. And seven of those have been recovered to date. The other two are still being actively pursued. <clears throat> In my discussion with ATF, they did pass along two additional things that, that, that were, I think, relevant. Um, nationally, they see a very high rate of recovery. Uh, the agent I spoke to at the ATF said uh, the number most commonly used nationwide is approximately 98% recovery. Um, some of those are have, having quickly, some of them may take some time, um, but they have a approximately 98% success rate um, in recovery. And that some agencies and entities, it can take quite a while to get data. There's been some discussion about individuals never receiving a determination one way or the other. Um, there can be some times where they simply cannot get information to validate whether someone is ultimately prohibited or not. The example they gave was uh, one state, they're required um, to send via US Postal Service any requests for clarification. And then the entity will mail back by US Postal Services any information they have. Um, obviously, that takes time. It can take more than, than three days for that information to move back and forth. Vermont, we don't do that. We receive information directly and respond within one business day um, before that. So I thought some of those, that additional information would just be helpful to put a scale uh, around the, uh, uh, the numbers that we've been talking about. And I was able to get that additional information from ATF specifically for Vermont. A couple questions, and maybe this is follow-up with ATF, if possible, is um, two questions. One, one is, uh, of those that didn't have a retrieval order, was there uh, a final determination that they were fine, or was it just that they ran out of time, which there is a time frame that the FBI has to work in, I guess it's 90 days. I, I, I'm not expecting that you have that, but if, you, if it's possible, since you have the contacts to see if that's something that they can 
one or the other is if, if, if there was any information on how long it took between the <coughs> start of that process and when there was an issue or an order to retrieve or information to send to the ATF to retrieve. So of those nine, how long, in the, how long after the three days? Uh, so certainly I can, I can check with them on that. Um, to see, I had included that in my initial query. Um, I will follow up with them to see if they can provide that. Um, I will say, um, to follow up with the comment the commissioner made about data modernization earlier, one thing that came very clear is the data system that tracks the number of retrievals, is the term they use, um, is housed in West Virginia, and they had to reach out to their Boston office for the actual recoveries, because their da data is kept in different systems. So they had to have multiple people work on it to even tell us of the nine how many were retrieved. So it speaks to that fracturization of data. Uh, it's not just a Vermont issue; it's 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 a nationwide a nationwide a nationwide issue. Um, one thing they couldn't tell me uh, regarding your first question was the number of incidents where um, the FFL decided not to proceed. They decided not to release the firearm. Um, they just simply put it back in their inventory and did not proceed it. My guess is a fair number of incidents that went past three days. Um, or the individual may have ultimately been denied. They simply never proceeded the firearm and never gave the individual the firearm in the first place, so therefore there was no retrieval needed. Um, there, there are, as I've dug into this, there are so many ways to slice this data, it becomes a little uh, overwhelming, again, to kind of follow up with what the commissioner was mentioning earlier. But I'm happy to ask if they have any either rough or can give specific on those seven instances how long it took um, for those retrievals. What's well, the it's, it's how long it took to determine that there should be retrievals, what I think more interested in. I mean, both of those data points are important. Uh, yeah, both of them, but I think it's how long did it take after the initiation of the process to determine that one was thing, a prohibited person. So one thing I'll absolutely ask uh, that, that may be, given that we're talking about two different federal entities, uh, it may be somewhat challenging, but I'll certainly pursue that. <coughs> one thing the ATF agent that I spoke to did share with me uh, was that they find that 30 days is the, um, uh, up until 30 days, you don't see a lot of additional data. And after 30 days, because of the manual nature, that's when they start to see more data coming in. Um, that if the determination is not made in three days, it's uncommon for it to be made in four or five. It can take quite a while because they're manually running down data or dealing with the Postal Service transactions, et cetera. And that is when they see a lot of additional data coming in is past the 30 day window. She couldn't give me a number on that, but just operationally, that's their experience. Wow. So 20, you said 2018 was the year? The most recent year we had. Uh, yes, so there was uh, nine retrievals? Yes, sir. And seven were, were retrieved? Have been retrieved, yes, sir. So out of those nine, or, or the two uh, in Vermont, were, and I don't know if there's any way to know, was there, uh, were those people involved in any kind of crime with, that, with the rifles, or with rifles with firearms? And nationally, is there any numbers on that? I'm not aware. Uh, um, I can inquire on the second. I to be candid. I have a feeling they're not going to really be able to to, to provide um, that. We'd have to actually do an investigation into the people to see whether or not, and then try to determine if they committed any further crimes. Was the firearm they specifically received was involved? Um, uh, that would be outside of my ability to investigate. Um, but somebody potentially potentially could. Um, Right. There. Yeah, I, th I thought it would be kind of hard to get up. It, it, um, it, um, so as I, w I was surprised, given that there were over forty-one thousand checks, that it turned out they were nine retrievals ultimately issued of those forty-one thousand checks, and seven had been recovered. And they were very clear to stress that twenty eighteen is not that long ago. They may they may eventually recover one or both of those two additional firearms. So uh, we may have covered it before. What, what, uh, when there's a retrieval, uh, what's the process? How's it start? I guess. I know eventually they're probably going to have contact with the person, but absolutely. The, the, as I understand it, and this isn't anything we're directly involved in, so this is based on conversations with both FBI and ATF. Uh, the FBI will contact, and they have a very strong partnership with the ATF. That this individual um, received a firearm that they shouldn't have. Um, here's the information. Here's all the contact information we have, etc. The FFL dealer or anything else they have, and the ATF then actually. Uh, proceeds to to retrieve that firearm um, 
one thing the ATF agent I did speak with, uh, where they sometimes see a challenge is the in individual has moved, um, so they don't have a good address, and it can be hard to track that person down. Uh, so there's a, there's no phone call, email, letter. They they physically, as soon as they have the information, they physically try to find them. That's my understanding. Right. Yes, okay. that's my understanding. Yes, makes sense. Um, and there may be communication with the uh, uh, U.S. attorney for the jurisdiction because that individual is is in possession of, uh, of a prohibited item. At that point. But that would be well outside. I just understand that from uh, what they've shared with me. Right. So, okay. Any additional information I can? <coughs> so thank you everyone for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.